Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello, this is Robert Picardo, the holographic doctor from Star Trek Voyager and Commander Woolsey from Stargate Atlantis. If I only get in Star Wars someday, I will have made the trifecta. And you're listening to Neil Before Pod because you are smart. Welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that will be celebrating Star Wars Day with an Ewok party. Why not? I'm your host, Craig, and this year for Star Wars Day, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, we are going to be discussing the two Ewok movies. Yes, those things exist. Caravan of Courage and The Battle for Endor. Joining me, as always, for some Star Wars conversations, we have Natalie. Hello. 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 Briefly thought about doing some sort of Ewok attempt at talking, but my brain went blank. Well, you'll have to give that a go later then. And Angus, do you have any Ewok isms that you're going to introduce yourself in? Yup nub, Craig. Yup nub. <laughs> Damn, yup nub. You preempted my intro. <laughs> well, I think how can you be on an Ewok podcast and then not have an attempt at talking Ewok? I don't know if yup nub said in these things. Oh, there's definitely some yub nubbing. Yeah, I think there's yub nubs all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for some reason this year we're talking about the Ewok movies for Star Wars Day, so let's start with our spoiler-free thoughts, get straight into that, in case we can spoil this for anybody that's listening. Natalie, you go first. What do you think of these two films? I just want to quickly ask, actually, why did we choose to cover the Ewok films? Well, I'm going to get to that, but it wasn't my idea. (laughs) Was it my idea? No. Okay, good. I feel like everyone's looking at me. (laughs) You should. (laughs) It definitely felt like that could have been something that I would have suggested, because I definitely feel that prior to having watched these films, (laughs) that I was so excited that first Ewok films existed and they were given their own space, and two, that I hadn't seen them, and so, of course, it was going to be incredible when I finally sat down to watch the movies. And I have to just say, for anyone listening, I'm chuckling because I have the first one on in the background. Subjecting yourself to it again? Yeah, just as a little visual reminder, because I think, spoiler-free, I was left going, what was that? And really questioning how what came to be came to be. Is that a spoiler? No. Great, then I think let's go to Gus. <laughs> Angus, what did you think of these? I had vague, vague, vague memories of these things, and I don't think I'd ever seen either of them all the way through. They just kind of melted into my subconscious somehow, along with droids and Ewoks cartoons that were all just part of that post-original trilogy stuff that people tried to get their hands on back in the day and milk Star Wars for all it was worth. We milk Star Wars for all it's worth. Yeah, spoiler free, given the choice again, I would not watch these both on the same night. (laughs) (laughs) Too scary, really. Mm -hmm. There's some fairly scary parts. Disney Plus says this is for ages six and up. We both qualified, that was fine. But I think that there are some scary parts. I think that they're attempting to do a kind of 80s fantasy or adventure story that is done better elsewhere and lean heavily into the, the Ewok stuff that turned a lot of people off of. Return of the Jedi. So if you're a kid and you always wanted to be in a Star Wars movie, then these films are for you because you can kind of see yourself represented there. Otherwise, I don't think they hold a whole lot of value. So when you suggested this last year, or perhaps maybe the year before, I can't remember when you first came up with the idea of when we're finished the main series films, we should do the Ewok movies, but it's your fault. And it's one of those things that I agreed to at the time thinking, yeah, that'll be a fun novelty. And then I was half an hour into the first one. And I checked how long it had been on for and realised it had only been half an hour and there was another hour to go. And I remember having a bit of a grimace when I noticed that both of them were about 90 minutes each. Mm -hmm. For some reason I had in my head that they were only like 45 minutes or something like that, but no, they're not. No, they're feature length. Properly feature length. The novelty very quickly wore off. 
I didn't have a good time with these at all. <laughs> They're not for me. I've said to other people, yeah, tune in to Neil Before Pod where you can hear me tear apart films starring people dressed as bears that are made for kids. <laughs> and that's what's basically going to happen today because <laughs> I was not a fan of either of these. <laughs> I think the second one was a little bit better than the first one. What? Really? I'm of the uh, opposite opinion. Yeah. Okay. And that's maybe because by the time we watched it, I was just uh, <laughs> fed up with Ewoks. Oh, it was just... It's like that Family Guy joke where Peter, as Han Solo, just gets really dark because he's fed up of Ewoks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I personally am very excited to hear you well, it sounds like maybe shred up some Ewoks because... Usually you tend to find a positive or some kind of redeeming feature, so I really can't wait to hear what you have to say about this. I'm not going to say that I hated every single second of it. But you should, though. (laughs) (laughs) But for the most part, I was pretty well checked out by (laughs) (laughs) of each of them. Sounds familiar. I watched them on separate days, which rejuvenated me slightly. I honestly feel like that could be wise, but as soon as I was going to say that there, I was like... I am so glad that we kind of got it out of the way. Just binged it and (laughs) that's it, done. Never again. We had a break between them. The second one I watched in two chunks. I watched the first half on a work lunchtime and I watched the second half on not a work lunchtime. (laughs) On a work afternoon. (laughs) (laughs) If only. I can honestly say I would rather be working than watching this. That's how bad they are. Oh my God. That is strong criticism. It is quite savage. How scathing is that? (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Anyway, shall we ask our friend Wicket the Ewok, or whoever our Ewok friend is, to take us into the caravan of spoilers? Let's do it. (laughs) Okay, we'll start with Caravan of Courage. Side note, there is a feature attached to a podcast that I listen to where they just talk about whatever, but the feature is called Caravan of Garbage, (laughs) and the amount of times I have to check myself from not saying that. I mean, is it true though? Because if you wanted to refer to it as Caravan of Garbage, you could. (laughs) Okay, so Caravan of Courage. Sometimes it's a nature documentary, and sometimes it isn't. And I was kind of on board with the idea of, let's do an Ewok nature documentary. Let's follow the Ewoks around and see what Mm. they get up to. Mm -hmm. But then they forget about it for so long while those annoying kids are around. And then later on, the voiceover comes back. (laughs) Is it just a crossed wires thing? They started off wanting to do this and then decided to do something else for a bit. I think that they realised that until Wicket started learning basic, they needed the narration to tell you what was going on. (laughs) I noted how light on script this one is because it's just kids marching through a forest with Ewoks, most of whom don't talk a language we can understand. They're talking to each other in in Ewokese, of course. I think early on you get a lot more Ewok life, nature documentary style. And I think, Natalie, you were enjoying that part because you liked the Ewoks before watching these. I did. But then once the (laughs) human characters get involved, it becomes less about Ewoks. And you were even questioning why this was called Ewoks or had anything really to do with Ewoks. Yeah, it's supposed to be their epic adventure. But they're just excited hustles to it. Oh, there's another one. I'm just making notes of the insults that May starts calling the Ewoks. It's so aggressive, this film. It's bratty kid. It's really interesting. So I thought it had a really strong opening sequence. I really loved the storytelling aspect. It's Burl Ives and he's sort of saying, a long time ago there were these creatures, the Ewoks, and we're going to find out what they're up to. And I was like, I am so on board with this. Let's find out what happens. I mean, it's quite funny. You've got your Ewok dancing and gallivanting and using their skin gliders. <laughs> the name of that makes me want to book. And it's ruined completely when they have humans in it. And it really annoyed me. I think if this film just had only Ewoks in it and they just spoke Ewokese and we just had the narrator... It would have been fantastic. Yeah, I would prefer that. And I actually noted that I think the second one suffers for having a longer script and having more dialogue. I preferred this one on reflection, comparing them. I would prefer watching them just walk about and do things without talking to each other or anyone else. And then the script in the second one made me long for the days before they'd learned any English. Mm. That they didn't forget by the time of Return of the Jedi somehow. Yes. You know, I wondered about this and I wondered if it's 
presented to us in a language that we understand for our benefit, but they're not actually speaking English? What if it's that they're French? You've stumbled upon a theory that is echoed on Wikipedia. What is it? <laughs> in order to headcanon this into yeah. the continuity. Wicket into, might speak French. Yes, to allow Wicket to <laughs> not be able to communicate with Leia when she encounters mm. him on Endor, mm. Forest Moon of Endor. It's posited that the family that are in this aren't actually speaking Galactic Basic, and it's just being presented to yeah. us. For us to understand, because we speak Galactic Basic. <laughs> we do, we do. Where to even get into this? It's such a dark film. I think for being a film that's aimed at children of super fans of Star Wars, it's really depressing. The first 10 minutes, you've got these two kids, their parents are looking for them, they've been left in a crashed ship. The little girl, the youngest one, I don't know if she's maybe like five or something, and she gets really sick, and then just completely passes out and the Ewoks have to try and help her. Who thought of this as the first 15 minutes of an Ewok adventure? <laughs> Crucially, they try to help her rather than try to eat her, which is something that surprised me, certainly. Do Ewoks eat human? Well, they must have. In desperate situations. No, I think they're just savage bears. No, they're not savage bears. They're not savage. They have medicine. They wear clothes. They have houses. They're not savage. They have gliders made of skin. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, if they were called leather gliders, it'd be different, but literally read the narrator and it said skin gliders, and I was like, oh, I don't need that phrase in my life. Who's skin? Yeah. Not first, you know, that the Ewoks aren't cannibalising. <laughs> Angus, I'm sure you're aware of the theory that at the end of Return of the Jedi, all those Stormtrooper helmets and stuff that you see around that they're using as drums, the people that were once inside that Stormtrooper armour were the meal prior to the party. Yes, we're consumed at the feast. I have heard this. Are you going to let it go to waste? <laughs> it's better for the environment. It's more economical. Circle of life. Plus they're bears. Yeah, what are they? Can we talk about their eyes? <laughs> like, I feel like creepy, that's creepy eyes. got to come up in this chat. One piece of trivia I have is that the Ewok costumes in Return of the Jedi didn't have eyelids. So they were modified to have eyelids for these films. But they don't blink. You sometimes see a tongue coming through the mouth hole, but you don't ever see them blink. No, but they close their eyes to go to sleep and things. Oh, yeah, they've got little pop-ons, like little <laughs> clip-on eyelids. I think the costumes look quite good. Well, they're clearly from Return of the Jedi, and so they kind of match <laughs> that film. And obviously they didn't have the budget for a lot of the rest of the effects or anything, but I think it looks like it fits in with that, which is convincing yeah. enough for its target audience. I have to say, having this on background with the sound off and the subtitles on is so much better <laughs> than watching it with the sound. I don't know what to make of that. I feel like I could get back on board with Caravan of Ground. <laughs> <laughs> don't, it's a trap. Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes Kid is quite annoying. Oh, he's the worst. With his Mark Hamill haircut. Oh, yeah. Didn't you read that he was chosen specifically for how close in resemblance he was to Mark Hamill? Yeah, and I think that what the doing is just having these stand-ins for kids to sort of see themselves in the movies and this is basically just a little cosplay dress up for anyone who ever wanted to be Luke Skywalker so they can kind of see themselves in it and less so a princess but there's a little girl character as well and I think Lucas's main intention was let's stick some teddy bears in Return of the Jedi and then after that I want to make a sort of adventure movie for my daughter so yeah. this is it. Wait this is for his daughter? Well in Star Wars that kid almost dies. Luke Skywalker so is supposed to be George Lucas. Luke Lucas. He was the kind of analogue for his creation there. And this was his adventure. But then you can tell that as his life moved on and that he was having a family and he wanted to start making content for them, this is what you get. So was his daughter really sick? Because who wants to cosplay her when she is literally... <laughs> Well, she does spend probably a bit too long in, in that mode and you really just want to get out on the road and start having adventures. And that is a valid critique of this. Yeah. And Mace is even wearing a costume that looks like a homemade flight suit that yeah. the yeah. X-Wing pilots wear. Exactly, yeah. Maybe cosplay exists on his own planet. Maybe. I thought it was quite interesting that the Ewoks are really open to sharing the source of their medicines and tapping into their natural resources that they have. Because I feel like I've seen a few films where there's maybe a magical flower or a herb or a potion or something that is a very guarded secret. But the Ewoks are so trusting and open that they not only 
take care of these two kids, but they reveal everything to them. Yet when they encounter Luke and Han in Return of the Jedi, the first thing they try to do is barbecue them. <laughs> no, I'd forgotten about that. They've learned their lesson after these movies about how to treat outsiders. And at that point, the Empire had come and raped their lands. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trust them either if I were the Ewok. I think what I liked more about Caravan of Courage over Battle for Endor was that the quest they had to go on was kind of Wizard of Ozzy. The kids lose their parents or they are lost. Their parents are looking for them. Their parents get snatched up by this giant Gorax thing. And the kids then have to go on an adventure to try and find their parents and free them. And along the way, they encounter two characters that they add to their party and bring them along with them. That felt mm. like they were going to go for three, mm. but they just couldn't think of someone else. So they just were like, oh, <laughs> screw it, we'll stick with two. And so you're kind of adding a scarecrow and a tin man or maybe a cowardly lion and mm. you're kind of making friends along the way and then you achieve your objective and everyone's happy in the end. And I liked that more than the other one, which was arguably similar, but we can leave that until we come to Battle for Endor. But that's what I think this was trying to do. It was kind of like a, we go out on the road, we go out to solve this problem that we have and make friends along the way. It felt like a similar vibe to a lot of films made for kids, questy films that were made around about that same time. Yeah. I've never seen Willow, but I imagine Willow has some similarities here, including Warwick Davis, who's yeah. also in that. There's a lot of similarities to Willow, actually. And you mentioned it's bizarrely dark early on but that's how kids films were at the time look at never ending story for example there's a scene where a horse drowns in a swamp of despair or whatever it is oh don't because that really happened yeah it's true and i think that it leans more into the fantasy elements and again in the next one you see that even more and at times i was thinking this is a star wars movie or this is supposed to be set in a universe where there's the force and jedi and things that we've seen but This feels, at times, when they're running around the forest or even when they're riding horses around the forest, it felt more medieval or more fantasy. I think that it's interesting that there would have been three saga movies, the three trilogy movies of the time, and then there probably wasn't a whole lot else. There was the holiday special and there were these cartoons and these spin-off movies. Star Wars wasn't as established in people's minds. I know it was a massive pop culture phenomenon, but I wonder if you could just make this kind of thing and be like, well, this is happening in a different place in Star Wars, whereas now we've had decades worth of spin-offs and tv shows and computer games and the sort of sci-fi aspects of it are far more well established if they made it now that mandalorian would turn up for the middle half hour to explain what he's up to yeah i'm just gonna reiterate i think i enjoy this film so far with the sound off (laughs) (laughs) so much better well there's something tell that to george lucas not that he'll care i have to say the little girl is a really great actor. She totally helps carry this film, even though I'm not happy that there are humans in this film, but she definitely is the better of the human actors. And that's including the parents and everyone else that you see, because the parents are so trash. Which is maybe why she wasn't brutally killed off at the beginning of the next one. Oh my God. (laughs) Are we combining? Yeah, we're combining our thoughts for the other one then, yeah? Because I definitely wrote some notes. Well, no, I didn't. I wrote them down mentally in my head. But there was... Definitely a few films that this made me think of. So Wizard of Oz, Alien, I think, when the Ewoks come aboard the ship and they find the child hiding behind this door in the ship. Mostly. Mostly. (laughs) Made me think of that. And then, yeah, the Willow vibes. Sure, there was a few more, but definitely got some Snow White vibes from the next one. I can't even remember what it's called. The Battle for Endor. Battle for Endor. I I honestly don't understand how that was made and how that's a Star Wars film. It makes no sense. The thing about George Lucas back at that point is Star Wars films were all essentially independent movies. They were made by Lucasfilm. No, but why are there medieval castles near the Ewoks? When have you ever seen Magic Rings, Meet Repulsa makes an appearance? (laughs) When have you ever seen any of those figures or those behaviours? Just the characters were just so off to me. It could have been something that wasn't Star Wars. They didn't have to try and shoo foreign Ewoks into that. Maybe it's quite groundbreaking in that sense then because every (laughs) Star Wars planet has one single biome or environment on it. Hoth is an ice planet. Tatooine is a desert planet. But Endor, you can see you've got the forests that we're familiar with, but you get desert and marsh and scrub and castles and it's it's actually incredibly diverse. Technically the forest moon of Endor. Endor is a gas giant or something, isn't it? I I also had to look that up on Wikipedia and apparently they're both called Endor. (laughs) Okay, that's useful. 
How creative when you can make anything up. I just want to comment again on the Ewok faces, their little noses, their teeth, the fact that they want to, I don't know, look emotion-full, so they stick their tongue through their mouths, so you get a little waggle of a tongue. That really creeps me out, and <laughs> I feel like they do it a lot in Caravan, and they've maybe reined it back a little bit in the next one, but it still happens, and it still absolutely grosses me out. The thing I was surprised to learn, I don't know why I didn't know this before, but Warwick Davis does not voice Wicket. Wait, so what? he's literally just walking around dressed as a bear, not saying anything. <laughs> That is his contribution to the film. Well, I mean, those are Who some powerful gesticulations. Wicked? Someone else, I'm not sure. Oh my god. Do you know what? They actually reminded me of something else. And I was like, why do Ewoks sound so familiar? And it's because they sound like the mice in Cinderella. Did you think that? No, but I haven't heard the mice in Cinderella for a long time. So oh, okay. I'll take your word for it there. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Craig, find out if there's a little clip or something on YouTube and listen to it. It is absolute spitting image spitting sound spitting audio spitting audio <laughs> i feel like they've used it for the movie were either of you surprised that there were actual horses in the first film yes and llamas and rabbits yeah, yeah. the sort of llama alpaca situation i thought ooh, they're more exotic and therefore more fantasy like but then there's a rabbit and there's a polecat and they've got animals kicking about there's lizards Oh, no, wait, that's the next one. There's a lizard and a mouse in the next one. They've really gone for some quite domestic animals. But then you couple that with some stop-motion animation of some pretty terrifying-looking oh beasts. Oh, God. The beasts are so scary. I thought the stop-motion animation was pretty good. It's obviously quite low-budget stop-motion, but it's okay. I would go with very low-budget. It probably matches up to its contemporaries. Did they need that? I think they could have easily not have bothered with it. I don't know. I think it gives it more sci-fi or fantasy beyond seeing Ewoks riding horses, which doesn't feel <laughs> quite right to me. Do they ride the horses? They They've ride got donkeys. Them. They form the caravan of courage. Oh my god, I felt so bad for that horse that's got that big nest on its back. Do you know the one that everyone gets chucked into? If it goes for a run at one point. Is that the next one? No, that's no that one. was this one. Oh yeah. Is this the one where they get given the magic objects to join them? Yeah. Yeah. Is this the one that he gets the dumb rock? Yes, because he dies very early in the oh, next yeah, movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so I really had issues with the Mace character. Not the actor. He's trying, but he could have tried harder. <laughs> the, the way this was written is honestly just really poor. There's definitely a moment where he really wants a crystal. One of the mage Ewoks or something is like, okay, people are going to take these shiny gifts. Someone gets a tooth, someone gets a gem a crystal and he gets gifted a stone or a rock and he's so pissed off about this that he throws the stone down and a different Ewok comes along, picks up and recognises that he's just been insanely rude and super dismissive of the mage Ewok. And then it gets to the point where he gets asked, oh, do you have this rock? Because this is the perfect opportunity to use it. This is exactly what we need. And he's like, oh no, I threw it away. And then the Ewok comes up and goes, I've got your stone. And then he's like, wow, thank you. You kept it for me. That's amazing. And then the next scene, it's like, what am I going to do with this dumb rock? It's just a stupid stone. And I was like, where's your character growth here? You've literally just been thankful for it because you've been asked if you have it. It's like they've edited it out of sequence. You are listening to Natalie Acts Out Caravan of Courage. <laughs> Thanks. And it honestly made me so mad because I was like, it makes more sense that he's like, it's just a dumb rock. But then they're like, well, but you need this dumb rock. <laughs> and then, oh, thank you for this rock. Not, oh, thank you for this rock. What am I going to do with this dumb rock? It makes no sense. Absolute shoddy work. <laughs> and there's just so much terror in this film. I just don't think I'd be happy watching this as a child. I think a lot of kids' films from, again, back then were geared towards scaring children. Well, I remember, like, The Dark Crystal and stuff, and that absolutely had moments of terrifying me, but it also had really nice moments of magic, of that sort of foresty wonderness. This kind of has that. I mean, the monsters in this are way more monstrous. I don't know. I, I did think it was probably quite scary, but then I'm seeing 
the dark crystal and labyrinth and various other things more often so i'm more used to that now i just wonder if the stuff in between the scary stuff is interesting enough to keep kids attention because mm. it didn't keep mine it lulls quite badly yeah yeah i think making this 90 minutes was a mistake it certainly couldn't hold my attention for 90 minutes so imagine a young child yeah i definitely had moments where i was like i think i'm gonna fall asleep and i was like i really can't because i'm pretty sure i fell asleep the last film that we podcasted about so i was like oh like (laughs) i can't keep being that person no the last film we podcasted about you disappeared to go play with the cat instead oh yeah i did i mean that was worth it way more than watching star trek i'm not gonna lie (laughs) seeing more of the stop motion by the way just to be hypocritical it's not actually that bad it's giving me clash of the titans vibes yeah i mean it's not as good as that it's not as good as that but vibes it's giving me in this sort of general realm (laughs) vibes yeah i think i agree with greg that it lives up to it's contemporaries so this is probably lower budget than some of those bigger movies yeah and it's a lucasfilm thing of old to have crazy stop motion creatures just thrown in another thing i have in my notes is that mace was drowning for about five minutes oh my god it's the longest drowning sequence i've ever seen i don't think i've ever <laughs> yeah. seen anybody drown more than this guy and he was fine I feel that like was they really terrifying. really did not need to pad the runtime it was the sound effect as well it was that canned sound effect of you know, someone <laughs> gurgling <laughs> for breath yeah it did go on for so long that i thought is this like a labyrinth situation where he has to go down to get up? So I kept on thinking, like, oh, he's going to have a realisation that actually he's either not in the water and everyone else is in the water, or if he goes down to the pond floor, he'll emerge back up on land. I kept on thinking they were going to do something kind of quirky about that, but no, they literally just trapped him under a big square of glass in the pond for a really long time. That was also quite scary. Yeah, and then the chief he walker with various stuck his magic stick in the pond and fixed everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that kids don't question. You're given all these magic items and they turn out to all have the perfect time that you can use them. But yeah, I don't think it was the greatest scene of Jeopardy where he's kneeling over the pond, touches it once and then is trapped in it. Quite strange, but they had to have something else kind of exciting happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because nothing exciting had happened for a while by this point. Or possibly at all. <laughs> Logre, what is that? Logre should get a big pop because he appeared in Return of the Jedi. So mm. when you get him on screen, you're like, ah, oh, it's Logre. Who's Logre? The one you refer the to mage. as the mage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Does he do anything in Return of the Jedi? I think he just looks like a kind of chief or sort of elder of the, the this Ewok one tribe. Here. He probably stands out a bit more because he's got a bit more of a costume than the background oh, Ewoks who so tend cool. to just have a hood on. And another issue in Return of the Jedi, one of the ways that they stop themselves from being cooked alive is that Luke uses the Force to make 3PO float so that the Ewoks will believe that he's a god. But they're just using magic willy-nilly in this film. That shouldn't impress them at all. (laughs) Yeah, but they'd never seen a golden god before. (laughs) Golden robot god. Gold Tony. I love that they have fire. Is that their mythology? We don't know. They don't tell us. It doesn't matter. This just exists so that they can go on a quest... With some kids, because kids need to be in Star Wars now. But that's how bored I was. I was questioning continuity as I was trying (laughs) to watch this, because I had to give myself something to do. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about all the evil stuff that the Empire was up to while this was happening. (laughs) If it happens between Empire and Jedi, I think about all the havoc that they're wreaking across the galaxy. I was trying really hard to just take this at face value and just be in the zone for an hour and a half and live the Ewok adventure vicariously through them and oh the luscious hair guy you love the Gorax oh the Gorax was so cool another continuity thing I was questioning at the same time was the whole Death Star thing so the Empire would have been building the Death Star before the events of Empire Strikes Back because these things take a long time to build so would a civilian star cruiser be able to get into Endor's system and crash land without the Empire noticing? And wouldn't there be some evidence of construction that the Ewoks would be witnessed? Maybe we've got a Galen Urso sort of situation where the dad was actually a contractor or working for the Empire. It's never actually (laughs) said whether or not these are goodies or baddies. Yeah, true. He might have been taking some leave from his construction job on the soon to be fully operational Death Star 2. He was looking for a place to put the shield generator. That's why they're there. Yeah, he was scouting it out, but also combining that with a family holiday. 
<laughs> I do think that they're bad people because I don't think they're very responsible parents. They do nothing to try and get themselves out of that situation. Yeah, they just hang about the cave waiting to be rescued, don't they? Yeah. Honestly, when you finally see the kids and the Ewoks turn up to try and rescue them in the cave, they're in the cage, they're suspended quite up. They don't make any effort whatsoever of being, oh my god, what are you doing here? How did you get here? You didn't have to come. Where's your sister? He's just there on his own. They do even ask, oh, where's Sindel? Is she okay? Are you guys okay? They're so lacklustre and they are the worst part of this. Yeah, and it's a shame that this was written as though it was written by children. They're parents in a kid's movie, so they're there to either be an impediment to the fun, or they're there to be rescued, or they're there to get out of the way to allow the kids to go on their adventures. But yeah, what kids want to watch this and go... They're oh, very badly God. developed, and they don't do anything. Yeah, they don't. Just add them to the list of bad Star Wars parents. There's a long one. Yeah, honestly, yeah. they're trash. They're so trash. The scene has just come up already where Sindel and Mace are looking at that spinning top that the mage Ewok is like, we can see your parents, and she's so upset, and she's like, please help them, or they're going to die. You're five years old. You should not be thinking about that. It's so depressing. And let's talk about the next movie. Did the actors not want to come back? Because you've got a different dad. Paul Gleason. You've got... <laughs> you don't ever see the mum, you just see her legs, <laughs> and you just see her son with a gun over her to Sindel, you don't want to come over here. I'm like, this is horrible. It's just so sad and horrible. If you could write any Ewok film about any Ewok adventure, I just don't know why you would write this. <laughs> just really don't understand it. Shall we move on to the battle for Endor then? I don't think we've got much left to mine from this caravan of courage. Yeah, I just want to very quickly say that I thought Burl Ives was great as the narrator. He had me engaged. Do you like the hair on the Gorax? Oh, the Gorax's hair was incredible. And how he got kind of sucked down that chasm before and he came back. Came back. Oh, they always come back, as we learned from They Scream. always come back. That was such a Scream move. I actually felt, watching this movie, that quite a few films that came after it must have seen this and taken inspiration from some things, which... <laughs> I'm loath to say. I feel like they've seen certain things and gone, we can do this better. Well, I thought the Gorax was quite a scary big bad because he was big. He, was hot. he did have good hair, but he was big. <laughs> Unlike the guys who were just kind of hanging around in that castle in Battle mm. for Endor. But oh we can move God. on to Battle for Endor if you want. The worst of the two. Well, I don't know. Craig's got an argument to make. Unless either of you have anything else to say about Caravan of Courage, we can move on. Just the. The Ewoks are cute. They were never given a chance or an opportunity to just have their own adventure. So the sideline of Caravan of Courage and Ewok Adventure is so misleading. I would hope that at some point maybe they would make another Ewok film and it would truly be an Ewok adventure. <laughs> and I just hope that I can keep a hold on to that slight glimmer of hope because this film made me kind of devastated that I liked Ewok. Well, this may be a question that we'll tackle later on in the podcast, so we'll park that for now. We'll employ the standard Neil Before Pod catchphrase of, we'll get to that later, and I don't know, we might. <laughs> if I do my job as host, we'll get back to it. Okay. Angus, do you have any final things to say before we move on? I still think this one's better, even if it was probably because we watched it first and I wasn't tiring of subpar 80s kids <laughs> fantasy movies. I like it because it's better having the brother and sister as two human relatable characters for the audience he's clearly a luke skywalker stand-in and that for me is fine because i always wanted to be luke skywalker as well i like the fact that ewoks don't talk quite as much and i don't mind the narration i think that's fine it's a bit of a mishmash but it, it holds it all together and i prefer the story of the quest and having to find those friends along the way even though they're not that well developed you get the guy who's supposed to be strong and you get the kind of witchy one as well but yeah as i said before i feel like they kind of ran out of steam with it and we're like well can't really think of a third one so these guys will do and then only one of them dies at the end as well Aww. which is a shame but yeah i think this one's just better all around i agree i think it is it doesn't stack up to those other great 80s fantasy movies but oh it does God. feel a lot like it's trying to be those I also just want to very quickly add that I really hated that by the end of this film that the children aren't speaking Ewokese because they have 
come in from another place, speak another language, and then decided that they're going to make everyone else speak their language rather than learn some Ewokies. That really annoyed me. Cultural appropriation irritated you. Well, it's that whole thing of galactic basic thinking that colonially they're better. But we now know that it's not because they're speaking It could be French, it could be some kind of other language. And I also just want to say that Mace is an absolute prick. (laughs) (laughs) His commentary on what he refers to as savage creatures, calls them mop face at one point. I'm quite sure he calls them hair on a stick or something as well. He calls them a hairbrush or something. And I think... That's just really unacceptable. I think, I think that's kind of indicative of 80s culture as well, where anything that was different was bad. So and you could just be accurate. as insulting to those people as you like. Yeah. <laughs> the best line I think he had were he just called them little bears. And I was like, that's kind of okay, right? I think. Is it? Maybe it's know, not. They might find it offensive. They might find it offensive. But he goes, rocks, these little bears are nuts. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. Well, we all know that Star Wars has no respect for nature anyway. You see them just liberally murder animals in every film. Oh my god, I think I hate Star Wars. I think this film's <laughs> ruined me. Oh, maybe it's actually the next one that I would say that about. I do wonder if there's more Star Wars I don't like than Star Wars I do like. <laughs> I honestly, Craig, the more that We're we do probably this... probably past the tipping point. I was thinking this, the more we do podcasts on these annual <laughs> celebrations, the more I realise like, I don't really like them. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm trying to come to terms with. Well, enjoy this being an annual tradition for as long as you live. Cool. What are your final thoughts on Battle for Adventures of Ewoks? Caravan of Courage. Yeah. I didn't like it at all, really. I found it really tedious. Too long. Characters were annoying. The story didn't grip me. Just took so long for anything to happen. I feel like the 45 minute version of this might have been tolerable Mm -hmm. but as it was it just dragged on endlessly until it finally finished (laughs) I don't know how many times I pressed the centre button on my remote control to see how long it was left (laughs) I think it was your first mistake (laughs) yeah I was definitely avoiding doing that because I thought this is only going to lead to trouble it's only going to have been on for 7 minutes (laughs) (laughs) but I think that the climax of Caravan of Courage I found more bearable than the next one again maybe because it was three hours into watching ewok movies i felt like the end of the next one dragged on so much whereas this one i was like okay it's over they've won they've defeated the gorax they found their parents yeah they all get to celebrate they're having a little party in the woods it's full circle but if we have to talk about battle for endor well craig liked it more oh seriously let's hear what he's got to say about it okay well yeah let's move on to battle for endor is it because they kill all of the characters that you had problems with? <laughs> That's part of it. <laughs> Great. I mean, to be fair, it makes me like it more time. I sort of appreciated the unexpected dark turn at the beginning. It does get dark very quickly. And I quite liked that there was more action in it. You got to see some blasters being fired. That was something that got my attention slightly. Noah is a character that I thought was okay. Wilfred Brimley. And I quite liked the little speedster Muppet, Teak. Oh, I did not like Teak. Was it just how he looked, or she looked, or they looked? I think it's just the fact that he's fast. I quite like that. What was your problem, Natalie? I didn't like that they put their really tiny hands and long fingernails in front of their face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so a very superficial dislike. I did this little thing that was like, he, he, and I was like, oh, I don't know why, give me the book. But I feel like Muppets and... The hints in workshop and oh. all that sort of stuff. They all do that, don't they? I think when I first saw it, I thought oh, it was kind of cute. And then it kept on doing the hee-hee, tiny hands, <laughs> really long fingernails in front of the face. And I just was like, this is so annoying. Is Noah the guy who's also the headmaster in Sabrina? No. No. That total different timelines of life. Because <laughs> <laughs> not the guy that plays Willard Craft, no. Okay. <laughs> who's this guy? Wilfred Brimley. What's he in? Everything. Like what, though? See every film that was made in the 80s and early 90s. He was in them. Okay, hold on. Let me think of one. What was made in the 80s? E.T.? He's one of these guys where when you look up how old he was in the film... And you're like, oh, that's Mike. He's only 42 (laughs) in that. How does he look about 70? (laughs) Was he actually 42 in that movie? In this? I have no idea. Oh, my God. No, I think he looked about 60. I quite liked Noah. They didn't really fully commit to him being a standoffish, crotchety old man. He wasn't standoff and crotchety. I think if they'd gone for that and that's what it was, that would have been better. He was abusive. I really felt like... Teak is in an abusive relationship with Noah. 
it felt really uncomfortable. He's told not to leave the table, they're gonna eat their dinner, they're not allowed to go outside, they're not allowed to do X, Y and Z and I was like, this is really horrible. But is that maybe like the equivalent of us shouting at a cat to get down from the kitchen counter or something? No, because he doesn't speak to him like it's a cat. He doesn't speak to it like it's a pet. He speaks to it as though it's someone that he believes is better than, but it screamed to me, abusive relationship. And that made me really sad. I think he was 50 in this film. Because you've just done mad maths. Yeah. That still doesn't feel old enough for how he came across. 50 was a lot older <laughs> than, than it is now. <laughs> I think that is true. I didn't like that storyline. I don't like the fact that Wicket has learned so much more whatever language it is they're speaking because I don't really like them being able to just talk to each other. I didn't really like all of the family dying so early on because I wanted to see more of Breakfast Club era Paul Gleason in a Star Wars property. <laughs> I think it's a bit weird that Mace is one of the main characters of the first film and then they just kill him off, maybe because Lucas thought, let's make this all about the little girl, it's her story. Well, because she's better. Yeah, she is better, but I didn't really like the whole, okay, now we've found a grumpy old grandpa that we've got to try and win round. And she's not bothered either when her whole family dies. She grieves for a little while and then she just gets on with it. She talks about her sadness, but she doesn't express it in any way. But that's very Star Wars. That's true. Owen and Beru get burned alive and looks like right cool I'll go now I'm gonna leave she looks at her bracelet and then she's like oh there goes my mom and then it's oh I guess my dad's dead now and Mace too when Noah's don't you have people missing you and she's like my family are dead this literally happened two minutes ago <laughs> do you think Noah would become her Obi-Wan and that if she were to lose him it would have far more of an impact on her in the same way that Luke didn't grieve that long for his adopted parents do you think if she lost Noah, she would turn to the dark side. But it would make a difference because she's not force sensitive. Oh, I wish she was. Why did they not do anything like that? It's somewhat refreshing to have a Star Wars thing with no Jedi in it. Yeah, and just tons of you watch. And in some ways it did remind me of episodes of The Mandalorian or haven't really watched much of Boba mm. Fett or Andor even. But as you say, it's kind of refreshing to have just these things that are happening elsewhere that kind of relate to what you've seen before. I mean, maybe not this, but the concept itself is refreshing. Yes, the concept, not the execution. Yeah. That's what she reminded me of. She really reminded me of. I don't know if you ever watched this cartoon called Moon Dreamers from the 80s. Nope. But she really looks like one of the Moon Dreamers. And she's so cute. She's really adorable. And also a really good actor. Way better than everyone else. Angus, did you catch the He-Man reference? I have the power. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was specifically a He-Man reference. I have to assume it was. Could well be. I think that you clock that one of them says, Oh God, I think that's actually in the last one in Caravan of Courage. I'm pretty sure the mum goes, Oh God, or Oh my God, or something. And we were a bit like, wait, what? I suppose you could be referring to any in-universe God. But it's just funny because it seems like they're referring to the Christian God. Yeah. And it always makes me think of Paul Rust on Star Wars Minute when I'm sure Han Solo at one time says, see you in hell. And he changes it to see you in Christian hell. <laughs> <laughs> Establishing in-universe that that was a, a place you could be sent. It's good to be specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's other sorts of weird anachronisms in Star Wars, isn't there, through dialogue where they reference things that we know. I think it's lazy. It's lazy not to have imagined a wider world or universe expression. When you've imagined so much, why would you not just imagine something else rather than... It result? is weird how like, they kind of substitute things in every now and again to refer to gleep glorps, but then <laughs> so much else is just colloquial. <laughs> Who's the guy in the animation for the battle for Endor? In the animation? If you go into Disney+, Plus. So you're about to watch Ewoks the Battle of Endor and then they've got like this Iron Maiden graphic. It's actually pretty cool to have that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite cool, but who's the guy in the middle? Go to neilbeforepodstore.com. Who is that? It's he's a very not, good question. He's not anyone in the movie. Unless it's supposed to be her dad who dies no, very early Maybe on. it's a young Noah. Maybe they cut out a whole scene of them being young. Maybe whoever uploaded this to Disney Plus put the wrong thumbnail on. I'm just thinking, I wonder if there's another version. Yeah, I thought there was going to be a twist in this film where Noah's like, oh, my friend went missing, looking for blah, blah, blah. And then we see that that person did not survive. But then the main marauder, I was like, maybe it turns out that that's Steve. A film made by Lucasfilm with multiple versions? Surely not. <laughs> maybe there was supposed to be a scene where it was young Noah hanging out with Steve. 
What did you think, Craig, of the total twist to just out and out fantasy where we've got magic rings, we've got shape shifting, there's a castle that's basically just medieval or fantasy. Did you just kind of accept that as being something that could happen in the Star Wars universe? I think by that point I'd stopped trying to rationalise anything that was going on. So <laughs> anything it threw in front of my face, I was like, whatever, how long have I got left? It's a good response. How long's left? An hour. Great, okay. Oh. <laughs> but you were holding on to Noah being a good guy, right? I quite liked Noah, and I liked his back and forth with Sindel as well. I thought they had some quite unexpectedly charming scenes together. Yeah, throughout the movie, I thought it was quite cute, but I just thought that they pitched him slightly too aggressive at the very start. I just think that he came off as a sort of domestic abuser. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> the writing didn't really seem to support his arc. Yeah. He wasn't fully committed to just being mean. Like, get out! Well, you might burn the forest down. Come in. Yeah. You can sleep here tonight, but you're going out tomorrow. You can see the steps that he will take because it's the same steps that anybody that goes through such an arc would take. But weirdly, they don't commit to it early on. They're but super basic. Yeah. There is no point where he just hates everybody early on and warms up. Yeah, he doesn't really have to change or go through much of an arc. Yeah. And I agree that it's probably, Natalie, as you say, basic in that he just has to be another grown-up in a kid's movie where yeah. he's just mean because grown-ups are mean and he's just angry because grown-ups are angry and he's just throwing you out the house because grown-ups throw you out the house. Yeah. I think if you told me that a child or a school group had written this movie, <laughs> I'd be like... I can see that. Yeah, I can 100% <laughs> see that. How nice. But I think that I can picture everyone from Star Wars, all the writers and stuff, sitting around a table, brainstorming, and then going, let's imagine we're the kids and thinking that they're so funny and so clever and so smart for trying to imagine how kids would perceive certain things. And it just doesn't hit any good mark. I don't think that many writers were involved. Oh, God. (laughs) And I don't think that in the same way that nowadays everything has to go past, there's a continuity group or there's gatekeepers of Star Wars canon. Everything has to go by the story group. I think at this time it was kind of the Wild West and basically George Lucas was like, I want to make kids films, so I'm going to do that. You didn't have Kathleen Kennedy putting her eye over it such as it is. No. I just feel like, again, it was another one that I think could have been good if they'd focus on Ewoks but they don't focus on Ewoks yet again they focus on like a strange Marvel Universe situation where somebody has to get a battery and power up a vehicle basically it didn't work for me at all I would have liked it more if it wasn't classified as a Star Wars film it could have just been a rogue 80s legend level fantasy film Mm -hmm. I mean I'm not saying it would have been great but it would have been fine I think knowing that it is part of the Star Wars everything makes it suck so much more (laughs) the ship that they ultimately leave the planet on that's Noah's yeah 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 so he just decides to literally build a house on Endor because someone steals his power supply yeah and then once he gets it back he's like right I'm off yeah into what because weren't you having a good time to get shot down by a Star Destroyer because they're building the Death Star at this moment in time. Yeah. That's what happens next. You don't see it, but yeah. that's immediately what happens. They leave the atmosphere and they're gunned down instantly. Yeah, it's pretty sad. <laughs> has George Lucas made a film that's not Star Wars? Yes. What has he made that's not Star Wars? THX1138, he made that. What is that? It is his first film. American Graffiti, that's also him. Mm-hmm. Okay. He directed American... Oh, wait, I knew that. Damn it. He helps out with Indiana Jones as well. Red Tails? Did he do that? I don't know if he directed it. Let's see if George Lucas directed Red Tails. Yeah, I feel like he hasn't really directed much. No. (laughs) Since Star Wars. Anthony Hemingway directed Red Tails. I'm sorry, Anthony. Didn't mean to do you a disservice. What is Red Tails? It's some pilot movie. Fighter pilot movie? Yeah, I've not seen it though. Well, I guess that's it for the Ewoks then, because honestly, I don't know what else I can possibly say other than it made me think of Snow White, (laughs) it made me think of Power Rangers and Weird Scary People. I think that at the end of Battle for Endor, they should have skipped the Battle for Endor, because I think that the battle was when that Marauder clan chased them out of the castle. I think that's where I was beginning to get frustrated. (laughs) Sneaking into the castle, fine. 
freeing their friends, fine. They should have just then been able to escape and power up the ship and leave. But it was when they got chased out and I thought, oh no, here we go. They've still got to have the battle for Endor that was the real problem. Yeah, it just kept on going. The villain plan as well, Terex's plan to just pick up power cells, but not do anything with them, was a bit strange. (laughs) They just seemed to think it's power that unlocks the stars or manipulates the stars or something like that. Yeah. I also thought he seemed a bit sad because he's sitting with his crew who were all partying and drinking away. (laughs) His throne wasn't even in any elevated position. It was just kind of (laughs) off to the side. And he was sitting there by himself, not having any fun. I'm so sad. Yeah, he was a really rubbish villain. Also, I've just remembered, you know, like at the end where he has Rita Repulsa's red ruby ring and it gets twisted to activate the magic. Because I think one of the Ewoks has an Indiana Jones... That would be Wicket, the something. main Ewok. So Wicket has that. And then the ring turns round and then suddenly fries King Terek. He's already twist turned that ring before and nothing happened to him. What's the deal? At that point, I was happy not to question it. I was thinking, right, he's done for, that's it. It's, it's <laughs> over, we can all go home. Don't have to look at his stupid not moving face again. It was kind of brutal though. He just gets burned to death. What about Cheryl, I think her name is? Or Cheryl, I don't know. I forget the pronunciation. The witch... The witch. Who's a villain, but also not a villain. Yeah, Rita Repulsa. Yeah, Rita Repulsa. It's that whole thing, though, isn't it, where you don't have any options, so you have to serve the evil. I guess. It wasn't really established in any way. She just is introduced to doing nefarious deeds. She's just there, yeah. Yeah. Endor seems to be a popular stop-off spot for a lot of people. Yeah. I just can't believe they've had historic environment Endor trying to preserve all of these medieval buildings and the Ewoks are still cutting around in their buildings. I don't know how they've not moved into the castles. They couldn't afford to show you the Ewok village. <laughs> yeah, we did not see that. The large, intricate civilization that you see in Return of the Jedi. Oh, yeah. Oh my god. They're just cutting about and maybe going to a small house or something. I don't know. Do you know what also you just reminded me of? That bit where they make another skin glider in the cave? <laughs> Oh, she gets picked and up by that. She gets picked up, yeah, by the dinosaur or something. Oh, that was bad. And then dropped, and then Wicket's oh, yeah. like, that's okay, I've made a skin glider out of bones. Yeah, where Wicket follows her, she's getting dragged off by yeah. a weird pterodactyl thing or whatever yeah. it is. That was quite early on in that, and the effects, I think they were over-ambitious and under-delivered, and compared to Caravan of Courage, which we've all now agreed is the superior <laughs> of the two. Sorry, Craig. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with it. Because <laughs> you don't care. I just don't care. It was a bit weird because they were like, okay, let's go for this. And then it just looked so bad. Yeah, I struggled to understand really why they've made Caravan of Courage. And then I really, again, struggled to understand how off of that they then went so far away from anything to make Basil Friend or it really disappointed. They do feel very different and. A bit jarring that this is a direct sequel to the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they do feel like completely different films, which I suppose is a good thing in a way because they're not just repeating what they did in the first one. I think it would have been good if this film had been better, but because it was so much worse. Well, they're both bad for different reasons, so at least you're not watching the same repetitive garbage twice in a row. And Lucas wanted to make more. He did. I don't think I was born when these came out, but I just feel like I wish they'd approached me. I would have helped them. (laughs) I feel like I could make a good Ewok movie. George Lucas, challenge me. Do you know when you could work with anything and you could have a story that goes anywhere or explores anything, again, I just don't know why this is what we end up with or how we are presented with this. People worked on this. People wrote the script. People directed it. People set up huge productions to get this underway. People got hired. What happened? It's so bad. Like I said earlier, All Star Wars stuff, or all Star Wars films, were essentially independent films because Lucas made them himself and he didn't have to answer to anybody. It was just Fox distributed them. So it was the same with this. He decided to make the Ewok films and then they got made. He needs to hold himself accountable because it's trash. He has a responsibility to the creatures he's created to not shit on them. These films, they take away from everything he's already created. I think I mentioned it already earlier in this podcast, it just made me realise maybe I don't like Star Wars. 
And I shouldn't be thinking that watching one of these side quests. I should be just enjoying it for its fun and gaiety. I shouldn't Kim, be thinking about I don't how I think it's ruined everything. I don't think you have to think of it as ruining everything. It's kind of the same way that people talk about if you don't like the sequel movies. Don't watch them. Don't watch them. If you like four, five, and six, just watch those. And if you don't like these, don't watch them again. It doesn't have to ruin the concept of Star Wars it for It ruins you. the concept of Ewoks. I don't know if it has to do that either. Well, it does, though. I don't think it necessarily does. I don't know how attached you are to the Ewoks as depicted in Return of the Jedi, but I don't feel like this betrays them in any way. But it's certainly my least favourite bits of Return of the Jedi is whenever they're on Endor doing stuff. <laughs> Can we get back to the Death Star, please? I'm sick of these stupid <laughs> little bears. I think I'm just frustrated because I became aware of these films not that long ago and was really excited because I thought, okay, great, they were made in the 80s, we're going to have some really great 80s aesthetics, it's maybe going to have some really cool original Star Wars music, which, oh my gosh, no. It's it did include the Ewok theme, which I appreciated. Only in the first one, though. Yeah, and then there's nothing. So I just was a bit like, he's George Lucas, he created them, he could have them do anything, they could go on any adventure. I just don't know why he had to write this one. I think there were TV movies in the US, but I just love the fact that these had a theatrical run in some countries. (laughs) I can't imagine going to see this in 1984 or 85 in the cinema, and this is what you're presented with. Oh my god. I'm sure if you were young enough, you'd probably be okay, but imagine your parents wanting to take you to this crap. I know, it's not as if there's anything really redeeming for parents yeah this is star wars but i mean it's not really star wars (laughs) it shows the versatility of star wars as a i suppose franchise as it became with the release of these films yeah and i think that these came out so soon after the originals that maybe it was a warning of things to come yeah well i think the ewoks being in return of the jedi was a warning of things to come Mm -hmm. this was the beginning of those things to come yeah and i don't know what the cartoon is i imagine it's just more of this but animated i actually watched an episode of it before we started recording today is it just more of this but animated Yes, you know, it's, it's like a worse gummy bears. And <laughs> well, yeah. I actually hold gummy bears in pretty high esteem, so it's quite a lot worse than that. I was thinking of gummy bears, actually, because it has that sort of aesthetic. Probably the same animation house that did it. Maybe, because I do think that Ewoks look so cute on the cartoon, and I almost messaged you to say, hey, it's five o'clock, we started recording this at six, watch the first episode, <laughs> and then we can maybe include this too, because I know that before recording we were concerned that we just wouldn't have enough to say about these films because I think we struggled with them and I thought okay the cartoon has to give me some of this joyful adventure feels and we can see the Ewoks be quite playful without meddling humans and again it was just really dark they've got such a thing for being just really dark and quite scary again crap well if you'd messaged me at five o'clock and said hey you should watch this Ewok cartoon before we start recording I would have said no (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I just honestly thought maybe the cartoon will redeem the movies maybe they will give me something that I didn't get from the films but that was not the case okay so I can remain tucked away in the Star Wars vintage section mm-hmm. on Disney plus the deep dark recesses of Disney plus yeah do not go in there it's not worth it don't click on that vintage tab <laughs> in fact after this what to do is fire up the force unleashed the second one, because there's an alternate reality, Return of the Jedi era, DLC level, and you can kick them in the face. <laughs> well, the Ewoks? Yeah. I don't want to kick the Ewoks in the face, I want to kick George Lucas in the face. The move is called Force Punt. What Starkiller does is he lifts the Ewok by the face, electrocutes them, and then kicks them. You can do it to Jawas as well. It's very satisfying. I'm okay. not playing that. Press triangle and square, and it happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Immensely satisfying. I think if they had that, but it was the writers, the directors, the script, all of that, I would maybe take part. Do you have anything else to say, Craig, about these films? Not really. I just thought this one was slightly better than the first one, because I quite liked that I saw blasters and stuff. So, the blasters? Yeah, it's pretty superficial. I'm not going to say that. (laughs) Meaningful reason that I liked it more than the other. I was like, oh, they're using blasters. That's pretty cool. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm glad that you've explained it and that that is the only reason, because I think if you were going to go into anything else, I would challenge you, and I don't (laughs) want to spend any more energy on these films. Yeah, like I say, I wasn't going to argue for the (laughs) superior quality of the sequel. (laughs) Gus B, what do you want to end with? I think that I could see what they were trying to do. They were trying to put kids in the Star Wars universe, make it a Swiss Family Robinson in space kind of thing. 
and adventure. I think that the first one works better for that because the whole family doesn't die and because they have to go and <laughs> rescue their inept parents, which is fine. And even if the kid's a brat, you get to pretend you're Luke Skywalker in a Star Wars movie. The second one doesn't have any of that, which is a bit of a shame as they all die. And it turns into way more of a fantasy movie, which is fine. I like fantasy movies, but I didn't like this one particularly. And it might have been because I just watched an hour and a half already of Ewok movies. But I'd say if you want something like that, but better watch The Dark Crystal or The NeverEnding Story or Labyrinth or The Princess Bride. Those are all from the same era and you get the same sort of feeling from bits, tiny, tiny glimpses of that in the Ewok movies, but nowhere near as well done as in any of those peak of that 80s filmmaking. I wonder if there's a tragic story about the actor that played Mace growing up to be a drug addict who never escaped getting mocked for this film, Jake Lloyd style or whatever. Mm. Oh, I hope not. Chewed up and spat out like the rest of the, the Star Wars stage. kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A question to ponder, though. We teased this earlier, so I'm coming back to it. Good host. <laughs> Do you think something like this would be made now? We're in this era of franchising and interconnectedness and everything has to be a million things and we have to make a million things associated with this franchise. I actually feel like there's a bit of a purity to these films that you just don't see now. It isn't obviously created to just spit out more content in the Star mm. Wars machine. It's a wanky term, but there is a vision to these films. It's Rubbish as it is. <laughs> but there is something of a vision there. And I really don't think that Lucasfilm under Disney would commission just two random, unconnected, just on their own back, Ewok films. Like I joked earlier, I feel like The Mandalorian would turn up for half an hour in the middle of the mm. first film to say, hey, I'm here and this is what I'm up to. Watch my show. Hmm. I do quite enjoy the concept of this just being a pure, here's a spin-off, you can take it or leave it, rather than the, the churning out of the droid factory of franchising that we're living in at the moment. Yeah, I agree. I think that if you're a child watching this or if you're a child marvelling at Star Wars and then you watch this or you don't, you've still got all those gaps where you can imagine all the different adventures and things that fill in those spaces in between. Whereas I think nowadays with interconnected universes and everything having to tie in from film to film and tv shows there isn't room for that imagination or for just standalone stories that do their own thing and don't have to circle back to the main saga or any of that kind of stuff so i agree with you i think that even though these aren't well executed they're like an artifact of a time before mm. yeah they're like a relic or something yeah yeah there's an innocence to them isn't there yeah, yeah. and that's almost charming almost I mean, yeah, maybe it's a little charming. <laughs> I feel slightly differently. And I think it's just because I still feel like there is room for a film dedicated to Ewoks having a real adventure because I don't feel like we got it. And I feel like there must be a way that that could be made and it be this not standing in for all of the blanks for adventures between the movies, but I think that there's space that we could just get Ewoks having a little fun time. Yeah, but you know what that film would be now? It would be Wicket's son gets guided by Wicket to go and find some yeah. thing that's Magical connected stuff. to something else yeah. in the Star Wars universe. I would watch it if they were all The on soundtrack the provided by Smash Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> they if go they were... to the remains of the Death Star that crash landed on possibly their moon, that, as you saw in The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> I just want a day in the life of an Ewok. I think that's just what I want. Well, that's kind of what I thought we were getting at the start of Caravan yeah, of same. Courage. Because you see them just gleefully hanging from a branch. And that was and when you're skipping through a field. That was when your face was lit up and then it slowly <laughs> dropped and fell as you thought, oh. What have they done here? What have they done? Yeah. I think, and it's just because I'm wishful thinking here, I'm saying I think through space. I want there to be space for that movie and I think it's because I want to feel just free from the rest of the Star Wars universe with those characters. I just think Ewoks are deserving of their own goddamn movie. But I don't think you would get it now. No, but if it's not projected to make millions of dollars then it's not gonna happen. I feel like if they made an Ewok film now, I would go and watch it because I'd be like okay maybe they've learned from all of their mistakes. This is going to be Incredible. And that's why they keep suckering you in. That's why you keep watching it. I guess Mace died off screen, so there's still a chance that he's out there. <laughs> yeah, it could have been that his bangle broke off. No one thought about that. Yeah, it's his weird communicator bangle. I hold up hope. Hold up. Hold out. I hold out hope that there is space for a frolic and good time with the Ewoks. There's maybe room in this vast franchise for these 
little guys to do nothing, essentially. Yeah, but I'd be with them for that. They could commission a documentary style thing, even get David Attenborough to do it. That'd be cool. (laughs) No, unless you're going to do that with humans. I don't need it. They have agency. Just watching porgs fly about. (laughs) <laughs> on cliff sides. Yeah. I think there's a whole sub franchise of Star Wars nature documentaries that we could make. Not us, but they could make. Yeah. Mm, I don't know if I would watch them too. The mating habits of wild rancor. <sighs> right, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever other weird creatures. The ones that live inside the big worm. Or even a documentary about the big worm that lives in yeah, an asteroid. The big worm. Mm. And then maybe it's also the same big worm in Tremors. I don't know. Do you have any final thoughts, Gus, for this one? We are about to play through, or we are actually playing through Return of the Jedi on the Skywalker Saga Lego game. And I don't know what's going to happen when we get to Endor, but I don't want it to be impacted by what we put ourselves through last night. Haven't you heard of the Caravan of Courage DLC that they're releasing for that game? <laughs> <gasps> I would like it actually if Sindel was a character you could buy. Yeah. That'd be cute. The little Lego Sindel. Unfortunately, I think these movies have been decommissioned from the canon. But I would also like to play as Ewoks. I don't know if we're going to get to, but I hope we do. Yeah, you walk up to Wicket and press triangle and then you're Wicket. And what? you can crawl through small spaces. There we go. <gasps> That's All something right. to look forward to. Your faith in Ewoks is not completely crushed. That was in the classic Star Wars Lego games. I don't know about this new over-the-shoulder third-person shooter thing. They've got to be. I can't even remember for the original ones. I'll go low gray. Who's the one that I liked? Wicket. No, no, no. The witch. The guy with the incredible hair. Grolax. Growlax. Crawlax. Gorax. Gorax. I'd be very surprised if they have oh, Gorax man, in Can you there. imagine? <laughs> That's the game that I want. Just keep pestering the... Lucasfilm Twitter account and ask for Caravan of Courage DLC. Honestly, Gorex's hair, luscious, <laughs> be amazing as a Lego character. I'm sure. Were those your thoughts? The very last thoughts. I feel like you're trying to wrap up here. I am trying to wrap up. I'm tired. Yeah, who's hosting this thing anyway? <laughs> I did desperately try to get out of hosting this. Did <laughs> you? Angus picked up on it though. Aww, I feel like I could have hosted, but whatever. What are your final thoughts, Craig? My final thoughts are, I, I'm glad uh, I've seen these and never have to watch them again. So that's an itch that has been scratched and does not need to be scratched again. <laughs> You're such a Noah. <laughs> Or possibly a wound that's been closed that I don't need to aggravate. I don't know. Something Mm -hmm. along those lines. It was an interesting curiosity to watch these because I've never seen them before. It expands on the Star Wars things I've had exposure to. But now that I've seen them, I feel like my life didn't need that in it. (laughs) But I wouldn't have known that unless I watched them. So it's that Catch-22, isn't it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I know you can always talk on them with authority. Yeah, anytime someone asks me if I've seen the Ewok films, I'll say, yes, they're terrible. And I can say they're terrible because I've seen them and think they're terrible. It's an informed opinion. Yeah, and I have to say this is such a rare occasion, but I I agree with Craig. Wow. (laughs) Who knew it would take the battle for Endor for this to finally happen? Not that that is marginally better, but just that these films are stinking. And I was very curious and trepidatious. People kept on saying that these films were terrible. But I still held out that they would actually be fantastic. And I think I just went in. My expectations were not aligned with the reality. So I was just sorely disappointed. And I've already had to warn people at work when I said what we were podcasting about tonight. And they were like, what is this? An Ewok movie? And I was like, not just an Ewok movie, two Ewok movies. And they immediately had to Google it. And I was like, don't do this to yourself. If you've lived without these... You don't need to open that door because it is disappointing. It's something you just can't come back from. It's just that thing though. I think the QRC is going to get the better of people who haven't seen it. They're going to watch it and they're going to be painfully aware that they're not immortal and they're not going to get those three hours back. To be fair, I think if people are going to watch it without any skin in the game, such as having to prepare for a podcast, they might not make it through the first 20 minutes because I wouldn't have. Yeah. If there are any skin gliders in the game. Oh, skin gliders. If we weren't doing this podcast and I decided I'm going to give these Ewok films a go because I've never seen them, I probably would have turned it off after about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. The point where I checked how long the film had been on for and realised that still had at least an hour to go, that would have been the point where I thought, that's it, I'm done. That is a painful realisation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The definition of suffering for your art, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah. Next year, we'll maybe watch something a bit better. <laughs> what is next? There's a lot to choose from that we haven't covered. 
My suggestion would be the Clone Wars movie, the animated Clone Wars movie. Mm, I think I did see that at the cinema, and I think I may have fallen asleep. I think I went with Lanny. That leads to hate, which leads to anger, <laughs> which leads to suffering. The introduction of Ahsoka, we could watch that for next what? year. What? Why are we on all these subpar movies? Clone Wars is good. I can't remember it, but I remember being dragged to the cinema with a really good friend of ours because he wanted to watch it and I was a bit disappointed. Shall we explore why that was next year then? Sure. Maybe I'll love it. Because over subsequent years there'll just be things like watching an arc of Clone Wars and talking about that or watching a couple episodes of Rebels or something else. Whatever other Star Wars stuff is kicking about we'll blit about and see what we can yeah. talk about. But I think the Clone Wars movie is probably a good place to start. Okay. Because we've got the introduction of Ahsoka, who is going to be a really important character. Oh, the character with the really cool hair ears. Yeah, Anakin's Padawan. Like a sea slug. Okay, I'm back on board. So that's what we're doing next year, Clone Wars movie. Right. And then the year after that, probably some other Clone Wars episodes. Who knows? Oh, I think the year after that I might step down. <laughs> <laughs> Guess we'll see. We'll find out. Join us next year for something that we might like. Yeah. There's every possibility. <laughs> <laughs> so is that us then? No more chat about Ewoks. We're done with Ewoks now. I am done with the Ewoks now. You can use that as a direct quote. Angus, are you done with the Ewoks? Yes, I am done. Good. I'm tired of these mother flipping bears on this mother flipping Star Cruiser. <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's a possibility for a Star Wars thing. Some kind of creature on a thing type movie. Can you please make sure that you use an image that is a close-up of one of the Ewok faces? You can see its glassy, beady eyes not looking where it's supposed to, and its tongue is sticking out through the teeth. If you can find that image and save me looking for it, go right ahead. Challenge accepted. And if we still do titles at one point when Wicket was getting disturbed over and over again, I came out with the pun, no rest for the Wicket. <laughs> I feel like I had to squeeze that in there. Yeah. I could title the podcast The Ewok Movies hyphen No Rest for the Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We've gone super niche this year, guys. I love it. I've just Googled Ewok dumb face tongue. Let's see if that brings us an image. While she's doing that, I'm going to wrap this thing up. Oh. That was our conversation about the two Ewok movies. Angus, thank you for appearing. And oh. good up and up to you. And Natalie, thank you for appearing. Thanks. I'd like to thank Ian Wright and 331 Erock for the supplied music. If you enjoyed what you heard here, then please do hit subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We would usually like you to do a star rating and a comment to associate with that star rating. But Natalie, how many stars would this podcast merit, do you think? The podcast? Oh, wait, I can get this this time. Five. Bingo. Well done. <laughs> If you want to discuss Ewoks, Star Wars in general, or anything else, please do hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or you can leave us a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. And as always, we hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod. Happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you all. And also with you. Yup, yup. <laughs>